Light His Fire, featuring Ellen Kreidman. Ellen is the author of the Light His Fire and Light Her Fire audio cassette series. Her best-selling books have been read worldwide and translated into many different languages. She's reached millions through her featured articles and television appearances. With humor and personal experiences, Ellen offers the dynamics for a more rewarding and fulfilling life. And most importantly, Ellen practices what she teaches, achieving success in her own life with the fundamentals for building a good marriage, a happy family, and maintaining a 30-year love affair with her husband, Steve. And now, romance is a decision. Here's Ellen. Romance is sending out a vibration about your mate's specialness and desirability. It is stopping in the mad rush of life to tell your partner that he matters more than anything else in this world. That's what romance is. For a man to be romantic, it is stopping in the mad rush of life to show you how special and unique and desirable you are. Now, I want you to look at what a relationship really is, okay? I look at a relationship like a corporation, okay? Here's your, your corporation is up here, it's the relationship. And then the officers of the corporation are the man and the woman. Now, just in it, and, and most of the time men can really identify with this, and certainly you can also as a corporation. There are things that we have to do if you are in a corporation that you may not want to do. And you can even look at this as your job if you'd like. You know, I may not want to take a walk on the beach with my husband, but my relationship requires that I do. I may not want to go away for a weekend because there's a lot of things that I have to do, but my relationship requires that I do. I may not want to give him a 10 second kiss, but my relationship requires that I do. So everything we're going to talk about today is something that I believe you have to do if you want that marriage, that relationship to thrive. Now, I'm going to talk about boredom because that's probably the most frequent thing I hear about couples who've been in a long-term relationship. We love each other, but we are bored to death. Oh, my life is so boring, or I find this person so boring. Well, let me tell you something. The best way not to have a boring relationship is not to be a boring person. And this is the most joyous part that I love, because you see, every counselor wants to do this. When someone comes to them on an individual basis and says, I'm so bored and you can't do it because you insult them, because I'm not going to insult anybody out here, and you're all in a group, let me tell you what. If you're bored, you are boring, you see? You can't be bored unless you are a boring human being. Now, when you say I'm bored, what you're really saying is somebody else out there entertain me, somebody else make me happy. But if you say I'm a bore, now you have to take responsibility. And I, the only way I know to get out of boredom is to do something that is outrageous, to do something that's so out of character, that do something that you've never done before. Because I'm going to tell you something. This part is really about creating a memory. And every one of you here can do that. You're capable of doing that. And I feel that when it's all said and done and every one of us is ready to say goodbye, nobody but nobody on their deathbed has ever said, you know what, I should have spent more time at the office. I should have put in overtime. I should have been more successful. Every single person is going to say, oh my gosh, the end is near. I should have had more fun. And most of all, I should have told and shown the people I love how much they mean to me. So why do we have to be wise when we're ready to die? Why not live a life that has no regrets and realize now that's really what life is all about, to give love, to receive love. That's all. That's it. That's the most important thing. And to do it in a joyful, happy, fun way. Um, this corporation is interesting because a lot of times, you know, I'm going to talk about um, one night a week. Here's the, form here's the formula for a successful relationship, if you really want to know the formula. One night a week must be date night. I do not care where you go. I don't care what you do. But one night a week must be time alone spent with your mate, period. Okay. Once every three months, an overnight stay at a hotel, an early check-in, a late check-out. And here's the hard part. A once, once a year, a one-week vacation for just the two of you. Now, that's the one everybody says, you've got to be kidding. Okay. I mean... Okay, well, that's good. I don't have, wait, 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 wait. I don't, we, we go through this. Anyone that hasn't picked up a copy of How Can We Light a Fire? I don't have the time. I don't have the money. I don't have the energy. We can go through all these things. Let me tell you something. Camping takes on an entire new meaning if the two of you go costs very, very little. And you, when you can sleep in, you can make love in the middle of the day. You can take a long walk in the woods. 
I don't care. I, I give you lots of ideas. You can trade homes with another person. You can take your children and li put them in somebody else's home and trade for a week and say, you know what, and I've had couples do this, where you take my kids and I'll take your kids, and then you pretend that you're in your home in the south of France. You can be on the Riviera. I really don't care where you are. But the pro here's the thing that I want you to understand. You must go back to being lovers. You understand that in the beginning, you see each other as a man and a woman. That's what you marry. It's a husband and a wife. Then later on, it becomes a mommy and a daddy. You don't have any identity. And if you don't go back to being lovers once in a while, you're going to lose it. You know, and that's, this is the thing. People say, I, but what if you don't do that? Well, you know what? What if you don't go to work in the morning? What's going to happen? You think you're going to have your job? Maybe you'll have your job for a week, maybe for two weeks. But do you think on a continual basis, if you don't go to work, you're going to have a job? No. The truth is you don't have to do this, but I'm here to tell you that I'm married 30 years, and I'm not telling you to do something I haven't done. We have gone away, and I have done this, and every single time I meet a couple that is about to get divorced, do you know what the first question I ask them? And you can do this too. This is a test. Your friends are getting divorced. Anyone that you know that's getting separated, first question I say, when is the last time that the two of you went away alone by yourselves? No friends, no kids, no relatives, no neighbors, nothing. Just the two of you, minimum for a weekend. Do you know what the answer is? I can't remember. Now, do you have a vision of this man as being a, uh, uh, a lover? No, he may be a dad, he may be a good husband, he may be a good father, he may be a good son, but he's not a lover, and he certainly doesn't see you as a lover. And I go to a lot of trouble to explain to men that a woman has to be taken out of the home. For us, a home represents work. I don't care. Unless you make the decision, like I told you, if money is tight and you, you trade homes and you pretend, and we're going to talk about pretending. But for the most part, when a woman is in her home, she sees the refrigerator that needs to be stocked, the floors that need to be vacuumed, you know, the house that has to, the wash that has to be done. She cannot be a sexual goddess in her home. That's the bottom line is what I tell the men, okay? And I don't really care if it's a Motel 6, I don't care if it's a camping trip, but when you take her out of her familiar surroundings and then she feels like a feminine woman again, then she can respond sexually. But more than anything, you're relating to each other as a man and a woman again. And I do not know. You know, if you're going to ask me, how can you stay married and have passion and excitement and good sex without going away and being by yourself? There is, the answer is you can't. You can't. Just like you can't go to work in the morning. You know, I used to kind of, build, kind of tap dance around it. Bottom line is you can't. And every time I meet a couple that's married for 30 years or more like I am, and I told you we, we go on cruises a lot, and you know, I meet other couples, and I'm always asking, you know, well, what do you think the secret is? <laughs> Actually, I met this one darling elderly couple, and I said, what's the secret? And he said, the secret is that um, we have a perfect understanding. She's perfect, and I understand that. So that was our perfect <laughs> understanding. <laughs> that was the secret. But they have always done exactly, you know, if there's a couple in this room that is, still has passion, still feels sexual toward their mate, they're going to tell you that they get a babysitter and they go out on date night. They do this normally. Now, and, and, and most people will say, oh, yeah, we, I used to ask the question, how many of you go out? And I never ask alone because it's always with another couple. It's always with another friend. Let me tell you something. When you go out with each other, you have to deal with silence. You know, and one of the things that happens is when you're always in a group, and it's fine, six nights a week, go out with your friends. I don't care. I'm saying one night a week, you know, six nights a week, be with your family. One night a week, be together alone. I'm saying that out of nine months out of the uh, eight months out of the year, be with your friends, be with your family. But four weekends, I want you to be away by yourself. I'm saying 51 weeks, be with your family, be with your friends. One week, be together alone. And if you're sitting there saying, I can't do this, I, this would be impossible, I'm here to tell you, your marriage won't last. And if it does last, you'll be together in a wonderful brother and sister role where you will you know, maybe agree to stay together for the kids, but there isn't going to be the passionate sex and the excitement that there is when you go away and you're together alone. And I'm telling you, we took um, two summers ago, we took two cruises. One we invited our children to go along with. And I've got to tell you something. And the other one, we took ourselves. There is no comparison. I don't ever stop being a mother. My kids are all grown. You understand, I'm worried about the fact, well, where are they? It's dinner time. Aren't they going to eat tonight? Oh, God, they're going to be staying up. How much are they going to drink? What are they going to be doing? Do you think that I was in a, uh, a, a loving, um, um, close connection with my, I had a loving, co close connection with my husband? There's no way. You know, I was still a mother, he was still a father. Now, the one that we went together with is wonderful, you know, and I'll never forget the first time I took my own advice and I did this. Children were very young, and I left my son, he was three at the time, and we've done it every year since. 
but he was three, and I left him screaming, crying. I mean, any mother knows. Oh, it was a knife in my chest, and it was like turning. And I left that, of course, you know, right after you leave, they're fine, but they put on this display for you. And I left tears, because this is the first time I ever took a week by ourselves, and it was the first cruise that we were going to go on. And I want to tell you something, guilt. And then when you get to the cruise ship and you see all the children's activities and all the people that brought their kids. Now, the third day, my husband and I are strolling on the deck, holding hands, kissing, nibbling each other's ears. We go into the dining room, and there is a woman screaming at her child, saying, there is no McDonald's in the middle of the Caribbean, and you'll eat this garbage. <laughs> and I'm sitting there saying, did I give birth to children? I forgot. Do I have kids? You know, all of a sudden, you realize once you're gone, after the plane and after you're there, it's like, this is the most wonderful thing in the world. I mean, we needed this so much at that point in our life that, you know, the kids just got better and better with it. And what better gift do you give your children to show that the mother and father love each other? Uh, you know, I heard another woman, this has been my expression for years, the only thing we give our children are roots and then wings. They're going to be gone. And so I don't care how good of a mommy you are, and I don't care how good of a daddy he is. They're going to be gone someday. And if you've made them the primary relationship and you've poured all your time, all your energy into your children, that's terrific. I just want you to know you're going to be divorced. That's it. You can't, you, you can't, and I'm not saying something that's absolutely outrageous when I say 51 weeks, be with the kids, be with the friends, be with anything, but then one week you get away. And I also have a thing, this is what I feel, is you either pay now or you pay later. You know, I'm always fascinated how couples can't go away for a week, but then somehow they have $100 to pay to marriage counseling, and let me tell you what a divorce costs you, okay? So the cheapest thing that you can possibly ever do is to take a weekend at maybe $59 or $69 that it costs you at a hotel. They have wonderful specials. Most of the hotels are very expensive during the week because they have the business travels, but on the weekends they have $49 specials, $39 specials. There isn't anybody that can't save for three or four months and then go away on an overnight stay and, and um, an early check-in and a late check-out. But those of you that don't, it's either pay now or pay later. If you don't pay for the good times now and the, and the babysitter and the hotel, you're going to be paying for the marriage counsel and the divorce. So it's really up to you. I would rather put my charges on a card and charge it and pay it off and know that I've got a wonderful, solid marriage, and my kids, it's the best gift I give them is parents loving each other. There is no greater gift, by the way, because they, when they come from a home where mommy and daddy love each other, that is their security, and then I pay for it later. So there is always a way to doing, and I think I give you enough creative ideas, so if I don't have the money, I don't agree, because I know right now that every single one of you, if there was something that your child needed, you would pour out that money no matter what, whether it was Little League or dance lessons or whatever, it's saying that this is a valuable, this is valuable. Uh, my relationship is the best gift that I give my children. Now, the other thing about, I don't have the energy. I'm so tired. Ellen, you know, you talk about date night. By the end of the week, I can't even see straight. I am exhausted. Let me tell you something. That's mental and not physical. And I'll tell you, I'll, let me prove it to you. Let's just say you could not put one foot in front of the other. You were so exhausted that you got into bed, and I mean, almost drifting off, okay? And all of a sudden, the doorbell rings. And it's a friend that you haven't seen since high school. And you think, you go to the door, you're exhausted, and go, what are you doing here? And she'd say, I'm sorry it's so late, but you know what? I was, I was driving, I went to visit my mother, and I took a chance, and I didn't know if you were still living here or not. And you'd say, come on in. And say, I know, but it's so late, is it OK? Oh, it'll be fine. Look, I'll sleep some other time. And the two of you would be up the entire night now talking and maybe catching up. And how is that possible when your body was so physically exhausted that now all of a sudden it's wide awake? You know why? It's the message you send to your brain. Because the message you send is, oh, this is a person I haven't seen for so long. Hey, I'll catch up on my sleep some other time. It doesn't make any difference. And you're energized and you're excited. But then when you look at your maid, it's only you. I'm so tired. <laughs> I've given at the office. I've given at the kids. You know, our relationship, we can put that on hold. You know, our kids are three. When they're 33, we can go back. You know, here's another one. This is another lovely joke. Couple who is 96 and 97 goes to a divorce lawyer and says, we've had it, we want a divorce. And the lawyer looks at them and says, you are 96 and 97. Why? Why would you wait at this point in your life? And they looked at him and they said, we wanted to wait until the children were dead. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, some of you, <laughs> you might be waiting until that point. You know, I don't know at what point you say, this is a good point. You know, I can't leave now because the child needs me. I can't leave now. They're teenagers. They're ruling the house. I can't leave now. There may be a crisis. You know, I mean, at what point? My child's expecting. I can't leave now. 
you know, the time again, as far as I'm concerned, to leave, to go, to be lovers is now. It isn't to postpone it for another time. Um, so I don't have, you know, I don't have the energy. It's the message you sent. If the message you sent was, this is the most important person in my life, we, I'm going to be energized. And again, I'm telling you, I did the same thing. I would get the babysitter and be exhausted, but I'll tell you, as soon as I went out that door, and as soon as we were on that date, I was renewed for the rest of the week. I felt close to him, he felt close to me, and then I could continue. But you don't have to continue to feel that tired. So, you know, I don't have the money. Let's see, what are we, I don't have the money, I don't have the time. Um, I don't have the time, you have to make the time. It's as simple as that, you make the time. If it, you got a call tomorrow, you know, why is it that if we got an emergency call that a friend needed us, somebody was having a problem, you'd make the time. You get the babysitters, you do whatever you have to do to be with that person, and we always do it when it's something bad. Why can't we choose to do it when it's something good? You know, when it's your choice. Okay, now let's look at some of the differences between men and women. <clears throat> Now this is where we get into, I know you'll be nodding your heads, um, but the men need to learn this. Women, women need to have emotional fulfillment in order to respond to a man sexually. A man needs the sexual fulfillment in order to respond to you emotionally. So what it looks like is women get an emotional response when they feel special, they feel beautiful, they feel needed, they feel important, they feel like they're a priority in his life, and then they process it intellectually and then they have a sexual response. The man, on the other hand, gets the sexual response first, intellectually processes, and then reacts to you emotionally. It really is almost a stalemate, but you have to understand something. We're coming from two different points of view. Now, a lot of men say to me, but I don't understand. You know, in the beginning, she wanted sex just as much as I did. She always wanted to make love. I mean, we were just happy as could be. Now she's got a headache, she's tired, every other excuse she can imagine. When I take them back to what they did in the beginning, you know, first of all, you cared about your grooming habits, number one. You know, you took a shower. I mean, simple things. You took a shower. You put on cologne. You shaved. You know, other things where you called her up for a date. All those things mean I'm special, you know. Now, here you are, kind of the Al Bundy look, you know, with a can of beer. You want to do it. And it's a turnoff. There is no emotional fulfillment for the woman. So if you want her to respond sexually, you know, man doesn't understand. We had a nice night Saturday night. You know, a guy just called me up. We had the best night Saturday night. We went over to a friend's house and we were all having a good time and we got back and I figured, look, we'd make love and there she is. She's turned off. And I said, did you two connect at all the entire night that you were together over there? Well, no. She was talking to the women and I was talking to the men, but you know, we had a great time. They don't understand that if we don't connect with that man, there's no way when he gets home that you're going to feel in the mood for sex. But if during the night he had gone up to you and said, you are the most beautiful woman here. If during the night he had given you a kiss when nobody was watching and saying, I love you so much. And then if he had just kind of brushed past you and said, you know what, I can't wait to be home alone with you and get out of here. If five or six times he connected you with the night, do you think you would be in the mood by the time you got home? Obviously you would. But that's what happens in the beginning and they don't understand why you're not responding later. The thing I want to talk to you about is that a man's sexuality is an important aspect of his self-esteem. It really is. Men look at sex so differently. They did a study, and to men, they really equate sex and, their, and, and who they are and what they're able to do. Do you know that a man, I, I, if I have that, um, um, I go through it on the next chart, but for, mo for most men, sex is the most meaningful demonstration of love and self-worth. The other thing I want to tell you about men, a man has 17 glands which must be emptied regularly. If they aren't, it can lead to pain and illness. I want you to understand something. A man must have an orgasm. He has to for his physical health. That's why a man, when he gets filled up, will masturbate. He has this urge. A woman literally could go through life not having an orgasm. I mean, it isn't a way to go through life, but you could go through life and you wouldn't get sick. Now, some woman in my class raised her hand and said, what man paid you to say that? <laughs> but I want to tell you the differences, OK? A man gives love for sex. If he truly loves you, he wants to show it to you sexually. That's just the way it is. A woman gives sex for love. She has to feel love before she's able to respond. A man uses sex to say that he's sorry or make up after an argument. How many times have you had an argument and your husband comes over to you and he wants to make love and you're thinking, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> you don't even know why we're having this argument and you think I'm going to get to bed with you? Unless you know what a bad boy you were and you're going to take your punishment, I'm not going to respond to you. 
So we need the we need the words, by the way, and a man is stimulated by sight. It just and I don't want to go into right brain, left brain, and why and all the reasons. It doesn't matter why. All I don't ever deal with the whys. I deal with what is. And the fact is, men love to see you in a negligee. They love the red light bulbs, is something I always recommend. If you haven't gone out, here's a simple baby step. Go get yourself red light bulbs. Any builder's emporium, any hardware store will have it under the party light. You buy the red light bulb, replace your old white boring red, uh, light bulbs that are in now. Let me tell you, red light, you look young, you have no lines, you have no wrinkles. <laughs> that's why, that's why they had, by the way, the red light district, because you look gorgeous. I'm telling you, yellow, blue, red is the color. Put in the red light bulbs, and tomorrow, whenever he turns it on, he goes, oh, what's that? Just say, you know what? Red is the color of love, and I wanted to fill this entire room with love for you. And that's kind of creating a memory, because every time he sees that little red light bulb, he knows that you want to love him. So something as simple as that, but they are stimulated by sight. A man usually prefers sex in the morning. This is, by the way, a grand joke. You know, somebody designed this. This really is a joke that we're opposites. A man generally prefers sex in the morning, and a woman generally prefers sex at night. And I'll tell you why. A man's hormone level is at the highest level in the morning. That's why he wakes up with an erection. Usually a woman, it's the culmination of a day. She wants to, first of all, be you know, wooed. You want to feel like you've connected with him. You wanted to go to dinner in a movie or dancing or connect some kind of connection. I remember when we first got married, and he would wake up, and he'd, 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 want, he'd be in the mood, and I'd say, you have got to be kidding. You can't, I mean, because I'm the one with the coma, remember? I can't even breathe or look in the morning. And I'm saying, and I get upset, and I say, you can't be turned on by me. I don't know, maybe you had a dream or whatever, but we're just waking up. <laughs> So we, we, have, we have different hormone levels. A man can get excited immediately. A woman takes more time to become excited. Now, I tell the men, it takes 30 minutes for a woman to get excited. Most of them say, 30 minutes? Now, this is fun, 30 minutes, guys. This is not, this is not torture, you know? But the fact is that it takes long. I always used to give the example that men are like a pile of dried leaves, and women are like charcoal. That's the example that I give them. Because, you know, a pile of dried leaves, you take a match and it goes up right away. It takes them much longer to get that charcoal going. But guess what? Once they're both lit, the charcoal lasts much longer and stays much hotter. So that's another difference that we have. Um, for a man, sex provides the relaxation he needs for sleep. My husband could be exhausted from whatever he's doing. He still could make love. If I'm exhausted, forget it. I can't, you know, I can't put my leg up. I can't put my hand out. I'm exhausted. I'm tired. Another thing is that sex, um, after sex, a man releases, now this is, the, this is the biggest joke, okay? After sex, a man releases a hormone that puts him to sleep. We release a hormone that makes us wide awake. <laughs> so of course we want to cuddle and we want to relate and we want to talk and we want to be told how much we mean to them and we turn over and we see this clod snoring. And so <laughs> what woman hasn't said, I don't believe this. All I am is a sexual object. You know, it's going to be a cold day before we make sex, when we make love again. And it's not that he is saying that. It's totally, his body is different. You know, it takes 75 seconds, actually, for the sleeping, sleepy feeling to pass. And if he can stay awake for 75 seconds, then he will be awake with you. But it is, it's a release. It's a chemical release in his body. So what do you do with this information? You know, the thing you do with this is, you don't take it personally. You know, again, it's like having a two-year-old where you know what they're going to go through. It's not like he's doing it to me. And, and from a man's point of view, you know, we were talking, I was kissing her, I was holding her, and then we made love, and now she wants to talk again. I just want to go to sleep. You know, and it's not like she's doing this to him and that it's never enough. It's that now she's wide awake and wants to relate to him. So we're very, very different. Oh, you know the song, I'm in the mood for love, I'm in the mood for love, simply because you're near me? That's the man's version. The woman's version is, I'm in the mood for love simply because you're nice to me. That's really where the differences are. Okay, now, here's the question. What if you don't feel sexy? What if you don't feel pretty? I get this all the time. Ellen, I can't put on a, a sexy negligee. I just don't feel sexy. Let me give you the most wonderful, wonderful information now that's going to change your life if you follow it, okay? I want you to pretend that you are sexy. I want you to pretend that you are beautiful. I want you to pretend any inadequacy that you have that you don't want to have anymore, I want you to pretend. Because the mind doesn't know the difference between real and make-believe. They've already proven that they took three groups of basketball players. One would literally shoot a basket every single day for 30 minutes. The next group would lie in bed thinking about shooting the perfect basket. And the third group did nothing. 
Do you know that the group that shot the perfect basket and the group that thought about shooting the perfect basket actually did exactly the same. They improved just in the first group that did nothing, got nowhere. The mind is unbelievable. I want you to know they interviewed Cary Grant once and they said, how did you become this sexy man that every woman wants? And he said, do you want to know the truth? When I was a gawky, awkward teenager, I used to pretend that I was a ladies man. And you know what the incredible thing is? I don't know when my pretend self became my real self. And anybody will tell you that what starts out as pretense becomes real. If there's a medical student who feels so uncomfortable doing the rounds, they really want to turn to the patient and say, please don't ask me a question. I don't know the answer. I hope I can give you the right diagnosis. But you know what? They don't do that, and they just give you the best they can, and eventually they grow into feeling like a doctor. If you were in real estate, you would be told, if this was your first job, go out and get yourself an expensive suit. Go out and get yourself expensive shoes, because no one is going to buy or list a home with you if they think this is your first sale. So act the part, and you shall be the part. Have any, has, have any of you ever heard that? And this goes especially true. You know how many men have said to me, but Ellen, I'm not the romantic type. And I'll say, I know, I know. But if you were, just play along with me. Just make believe. If you were romantic, what would you do? And the guy says, I don't know. I guess I'd stop by on my way home and get a bottle of champagne maybe put on the fireplace or I, I don't know. I mean, you know, maybe I'd get a, a special outfit like, you know, silk boxer shorts and bring her a rose. And I'm saying, sounds pretty good to me, you know. Why don't you just go ahead and do it? And what starts out as pretense, when she responds to him sexually like he's never had before, then becomes real. Romance, you're not, you know how you, you, know how you acquire the skill of romance? You either read it, you see it, or you hear about it. You know, if a man grows up in a family where there's a lot of sisters, my son, grew up with sisters, and he always heard, what an idiot that guy is, what a jerk, what an, oh, that, that's cool, that's rad. And he would find out when somebody brought him a rose, wow, they really, they love that. You know, and it's a, it's an unconscious level that he's gaining all this information from girls. Or if a man has a mother who has sat him down and said, now, son, this is what it takes to wine and dine a woman to make her, you know, fall in love with you, and this is what you need to do. Or it's an ex-wife, believe it or not, but there are many men who are now very romantic because some woman has left them and said, you're a clod, you know, and I don't want to be with you anymore. And so then they start to learn and they read about it. My husband has never in his life read a gothic novel. And if I'm reading a love story, he'll look at me and say, where are the good parts? And you know what he's talking about when you're reading the good parts? He doesn't care about the story. And so most men don't read anything. They don't want to go see a love story, some gushy, mushy love story. So if they don't see it, if they don't hear about it, and they don't read about it, where are they supposed to learn how to be romantic? They, most of the time, learn from a woman. And so to me, one of the assignments I give if a woman says her husband's not romantic, I'll say, I want you next week to make him king for the day. I want you to tell him, next week, you have an appointment, you do it in a cute way, you're going to be king for the day, Saturday is your day, and you come complete with the crown, do everything. You can you know, make love in, in the uh, uh, morning, take a shower with him, you know, maybe uh, book a sporting event, do everything you think that he would love. I mean, everything. And at the end of the day, when you're lying in his arms and you turn to him and you say, do you think that maybe next month I could be queen for the day? Do you know that no man would say no? Because you've already showed him now, this is how special. But if you turn to him and say, you're not romantic enough. First of all, those are words. You know there's not a man alive that knows what that means. If he didn't see his mother and father <laughs> being romantic and you say, you know, you're just not romantic. Well, what does that mean? Well, they can, if they break it down, I want you to give me a 10 second kiss. I want to go out on a date once a week. I want you to make a reservation for us for dinner. I, you know, whatever it is you want, you've got to let him know what it is you're looking for when it comes to romance. They have no idea because they're turned on instantly. All they have to do is see breasts and a leg, and that's it. That's it. They're excited, but they don't understand. You know, when I used to ask men, do you think you're romantic? Oh, all the hands would go up because they're thinking the bed, and they don't understand that, you know, when I talk about something that's romantic, um, in fact, the new outline that I have in is called Sex Gets Better with Love, Love Gets Better, Love Gets Better with Sex. You know, you have the man, if you talk about romance, he's picturing the bed, the scene in the bed. And if you ask the woman, she's picturing a beautiful candlelit dinner or moonlight dancing. So the, the image is so different. And the thing is, I don't want you to start to take this personally, but I really would like you to look at him as he simply doesn't know. And I ask both of you to pretend. If your marriage has gotten to the point where it is boring and you're ready to call it quits, I'll have you pretend that you're madly in love. Make believe that you can't keep your hands off each other. I've had a couple that, that you know, the, the body language is he's sitting here, she's sitting there, and I'll say, listen, for the next hour, I want you to pretend that you are madly in love, that you can't keep your hands off each other. I want you to sneak little kisses. This is what I want you to do. And you know, by the time the hour ends, they start giggling and laughing and kidding around and fooling around. 
Because again, what starts out as pretense becomes real. Um, let me just see. Okay, another thing that we talk about, especially in the How Can We Light a Fire? I want you to put sex on your calendar. This, I'm serious about this. I know people here, oh my gosh, what about the spontaneity? You've got to be kidding. Put sex on your calendar? Well, we put doctor's account, uh, appointments on the calendar. We put dentist apartment, appointments on the calendar. We put uh, car maintenance on the calendar. But oh, heaven forbid we should put the person that means the most to us on the calendar. Oh, we could never do that. Well, that's why I provide you with the little stickers. I want those little fireworks stickers. Get yourself a personal calendar, one that the children can't see, and you put the little fireworks stickers on these special evenings, and you give it to him as a gift. You, can, you don't need a book to do that. You can make your own calendar. But you need to schedule time when you are lovers. And if you wait for the time till you have the time, it isn't going to happen. It just isn't. We're two paycheck families today. Everybody's working. And with kids to raise, you don't have the time. It's called you make the time. And so what you do is you put that first on your calendar, and then everything else goes on the calendar. And you say, oh, no, I can't do that this evening because Steve and I are going to be together this night. Um, no, I won't be able to do it that because that's my other night with my husband. And then you simply work around that. Why do you have to work around the soccer team? Why do you have to work around brownies? You know, you work around sex on the calendar. So it's re-educating <laughs> re yourself. Um, now let me tell you also what spontaneity is because I think that this is really important too. A lot of people say I'm not a spontaneous person. Spontaneity is nothing more than getting an idea, deciding when it would be a good idea, and then taking action. Now, the reason we see children and we think they're so spontaneous is because they get an idea every two seconds in their head, and a half a second later, they think, yeah, that sounds good, and another minute later, they're doing it. So they're, they're very spontaneous. But just because it takes you longer to get an idea in your head, it takes a little bit of planning to decide when can I carry this out, and then it takes a little bit longer to actually carry it out, you can become spontaneous. That's not something that you are born with. You can learn to become spontaneous. And I've had wonderful stories coming out of the class, and hopefully today you know, we'll get a little bit of um, some of ideas from you. But one of the things, I'll just never forget, this woman used to come to class, and she looked like Grace Kelly. She was the most elegant, beautiful woman, three-piece business suit every single time she came to class. And she raised her hand, and she said, you know, I don't know what possessed me. I'm a lawyer, and my husband is a lawyer. But after your class, I was so motivated. I'd never done anything like this before. But there was a sleazy adult motel in the area that she went during lunch. She calls him. He's in the middle of a client. She tells the secretary, it's very important. You know, I want you to interrupt him. And so she get, he gets on the phone, and she says, uh, hi, honey, it's me, and I'm at the such and such motel. And he knows what motel or hotel that is in the area. And she said, I'm in room blah, 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 waiting. I'm completely nude, and I'm waiting for that gorgeous hunk body of yours. And he says, who is this? <laughs> and so she says, it's your wife. He goes, oh, come on, you are not. And she said, I am. I'm going to hang up the phone. I want you to call information, ask for the hotel, and then ask for this room just to see that I'm here. So of course, two minutes later, a minute and a half, 30 seconds later, the phone rings. And he goes, it is you. And so she said, yes, it is. And I'm waiting for you. And she hears him muffling, you know, holding the uh, phone receptor, talking to his client, saying, uh, listen, this is an emergency. It can't wait. I have to go right now. And so she said they had the best afternoon ever because it was something, again, a spontaneous thought. You know, how many times are you walking in a mall and you say, wow, that Nibbly J would look good on me. Yeah, no, it's kind of stupid. You see? But that's an idea. And then if you just say, you know what? I got that idea. I'm going to act on that idea. And then I'm going to just do it. And you know, how many times I hear women say they get a sexy idea. You know, during the day, they just feel like having sex. And they say, well, what am I supposed to do, call him in the middle of the day? Yes! My goodness, what's the worst that can happen? He has a smile on his face and he can't come home. But you know, the best could happen is that he drops everything. He drops everything and he does come home. You know, Why not? If you've got the thought, why not share that thought with him instead of letting it go by? I mean, he can say no, but at least that he loves the fact that you made the phone call instead of an emergency call, like, let me tell you what's going on with the kids. So to me, I think that you are more spontaneous than you think. You get lots of ideas, but then you think, oh, this is stupid. Oh, no. I would never do that. I mean, how many of you here? Book the room. Say, I can't leave. The conference went till midnight tonight. You're going to have to join me. You know, or you're taking a bath. You know, and you say, honey, could you bring up a towel? I'm out of towels. Let him join you in the bath. Just do something that is completely out of character, because I want you to create a memory. That's really what this is. I want you to look back. You're not going to remember what you made for dinner. You're not going to remember how clean the house was, what you wore. But you will remember the times when you did something absolutely out of character. You know, there's a saying, you will never remember the test you failed, but you will always remember the person you were with who made you fail that test. You know. So it's, this is the important thing about getting the memories. I had another man. He was um, um, actually somebody told me the story about this. This man 
was a very, very romantic man. And for their 30th wedding anniversary, he booked a hotel room. And when she got there, he had purchased a beautiful nightgown, which he opened. And then he said, I want you to go in and take a nice bath, which he had prepared for her. And while she was in the bath, he had the floors come, and he, he covered the entire bed with long-stemmed roses. Now, when I told my husband that story, you know what he said? What about the thorns? <laughs> And you know what? It didn't even cross my mind because it was such a romantic story. But I actually called the florist, and they said they absolutely dethorn the roses for you. They do that. And again, it doesn't need to be a, a, a whole bed of roses. You can take rose petals and just put them on the bed, on the pillow, and look at your lover and just say, you know what? I've always wanted to make love to you in a bed of roses. Or you can say something like, living with you is a bed of roses. I don't really care, but he did this for his wife. But here's the thing I want to tell you. His son is just as romantic. You see, he's seen, he has grown up seeing this man do all of this, to go out of his way, to make his wife feel special, and do all these things. And his son is exactly the same way, because he was, he was the one in my class saying, I saw my dad do this. So it's so natural for me to leave a little note in the cereal box when she gets up in the morning, or leave you know, a flower, or to call her and say, I love you, because I saw my dad do that all my life. So if again, if your husband didn't see that, then I don't want you to blame him. I want you to educate him. And I want you to do it in a very loving, kind, caring way, rather than, look, Buddy, you know, because we have a stalemate. I don't care. You don't give me what I want. I'm not going to give you what you want. And he looks at you and goes, yeah, well, I don't get what I want. You're not going to get what you want. And I don't care who starts, but at least let somebody start and do something loving that says, I did this for you. I didn't do this for the kids. I didn't do this for the relatives. I didn't do this for anybody else. I did this for you. And I remember one Valentine's Day because <clears throat> I will say that I do things when I'm bored, I will say, OK, Ellen, this is a real boring time now, so what can you do that will spice it up? Because once you think about something, you know, you get nervous, you get scared, but boredom goes out the window. And I was doing a show at the mall at those days where um, I, I had a booth and explaining the classes. And um, I was looking at C's candy. They had a chocolate gorilla. And I, would, I said, you know, this would be great to send to him about just kind of a cute thing saying, let's monkey around. So I found out it was a costume a place where they have a gorilla costume. And he was, it was Valentine's Day was coming up. And I knew he was doing um, a uh, seminar at the South Coast Plaza Hotel. And I said, well, there was something I wanted delivered on Valentine's Day. He goes, well, between 1 and 2, we're going to be taking a break. And everybody's going to be out in the lobby. So maybe that's a good time. And I know he thought it was flowers you know, that I was going to send him. So I hired the gorilla. It was about a 6 foot 2 gorilla in a costume. I gave him the chocolate gorilla. And what the note said is, um, I'm ape over you. Let's monkey around when you're done with this boring seminar. I'm in room 222. Now, you have to understand my husband because at the break, you know, the elevator opens and this gorilla starts walking toward this group of people. And he just said, please, God, don't let this be for me. <laughs> <laughs> and of course it was. And it patted him on the head and gave him the note. But everybody that year booked that gorilla, you know, to have to do something. But I want you to understand something. The reason I'm telling you the story is when he got to the room, I had streamers. I had everything that Hallmark ever made that said, I love you, you know, with hearts and flowers and candies and tablecloths and whatever. And when he walked in that room, he started crying. And he said, I don't believe that you did this for me. I cannot believe how lucky I am. You went to all this trouble for me. You know, and that's the message I would ask you. If your husband right now saw you preparing the most beautiful dinner table and the kids saw you doing this, would they always say, who's coming over? Wouldn't it be just nice once to say, no one, it's for you? Wouldn't that be just nice that it's not company that I'm cleaning and making and doing all this thing? It's you. You are special. You are unique. You know, now they've got those you are special plates. I had a wonderful woman in my class who was a great grandmother who took the class. She was about 79 years old, delightful. We just loved her. But she said she had had this special plate while her kids were growing up. And it didn't matter what they did, if it, they won the, you know, the uh, soccer game, if they had an A on their report card, they that night got the special plate. And it was a whole place setting that she had. And she said, you know, now my kids are grown and they also do that for their children. But to have something where, you know, I'm doing this for you, for not anybody else. And when I clock the hours that you take when the, from the time you invite somebody over for dinner, if I clocked for looking for an outfit so you can look good and clean the house and you worry about the recipe, I mean, it's work. Well, why not just once in a while? You know, once every three or four months, every six months, you put something in the calendar that says, time to do something special for the people that I love. Um, the other thing I want to tell you, something that doesn't cost money. Talk about no money. How many of you here have ever just left your undies off? Doesn't cost you anything, you know? <laughs> See, I didn't know this until I started teaching. Somebody said, you know, we were talking about romantic ideas, and I thought, 
oh my gosh, I've never done this. Now you have to understand, my idea of being, again, I grew up in a home where my mother, I always saw her in curlers and ro I mean rollers and a bathrobe with stuff on her face. I, you know, never got a sex education. As far as she was concerned, men are dirty and filthy. They only want one thing. I mean, it was an awful, I, thank God I have a man who was very kind and very patient, and it was a growth period for both of us. So I thought, you know, I've never done anything like this in my life. And I waited until, because I, you know, again, I'm thinking, well, when would I do this? Well, we had this very elegant affair to go through, and I thought, this is perfect. It was in the summertime, and I could wear sandals because I, was, I didn't, wasn't going to wear the pantyhose. And I was dressed, and it was kind of a long dress. And so we get in the car, and we're driving, and I said, honey, I have something to tell you. And he goes, yeah, what? And I was driving the car, and I said, I'm not wearing any undies. And he looks at me and he goes, did you forget them? <laughs> No, I didn't say, I did it on purpose. He goes, Ellen, you're kidding. We're going to, what are you going to do? And I said, nothing. Nobody knows except you. Now, again, I, you have to experience this the whole night. He is fixated on the fact that I'm not wearing any undies. He couldn't concentrate. He couldn't think. I've had women tell me that they drive off the side of the road because they can't concentrate. So, you know, I mean, this was something that's so simple that doesn't cost any money. And yet it was so exciting. And he still remembers something, you know, doing something like that. Um, I have to laugh because I was on the Sally Jesse Raphael telling that story, and Sally Jesse Raphael looks at me and she says, well, what if he makes you go home and get your underpants? <laughs> I thought that was, I said, I don't know. I don't know what you would do then. Um, okay, a couple of other things. Conservative women that I've had in my class. This one woman, and again, you have to see the women to just believe, you know, you see this little cherub woman sitting there using ace bandages, you know, tying them up. But this one woman, she wrote, in deep red lipstick, again, never done anything like this in her life. Deep red lipstick was motivated after class. You Tarzan, me Jane, let's swing tonight. And she took the lipstick tube and did it the night before when he was asleep. So the next morning, she said, he gets up and he's shaving, and there's not one expression on his face. He's like this. And she said, it's not like a little plate. I mean, this is across the entire mirror, okay, the lipstick. And he's just shaving, no expression. He goes, bye, sweetie. And he leaves. And she goes, I don't believe this. Well, 11 o'clock, the phone rings, and he goes, did you really mean what you wrote? I cannot concentrate on one thing I'm doing this morning. <laughs> And she said it was the first time in their marriage that he came home at 1.30 in the afternoon. And he just was with her the whole day, and then they planned the evening. And I had another woman that just wrote, again, in, in lipstick, cutest lyrics, uh, roses are red, violets are blue, I feel kind of sexy, please come home at 2. He was home at 12 o'clock that day, you know? <laughs> busy man, but he wasn't too busy. So, you know, I mean, all these ideas that come, and the fact is that if you're waiting to, you see, a lot of people wait until they don't feel fearful. Because a lot of you, I know this. what this is evoking. It's, this is nervous. This is scary. Because, And I always tell you, start with the baby steps. Start with the red light bulb. Do something very little that just says, I did this for you. But if you wait for your, for your heart to stop racing and not be nervous, it'll never happen. Do you know how long it would be if I said to you, wait until you go on your first date when you are calm and you're not nervous? You would never date. And do you know that women who have dated maybe in their 60s for the first time because they've lost their mate, they're still as scared as they were when they were 13 years old. And if you wait for the fear to go away, you're never going to do anything. So that, you know, the thing that I teach is, and I understand that Susan Jeffers has a wonderful book called Feel the, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway, but I've always said that, feel the fear and do it anyway. You know, be afraid. And it may, it may goof, it, it may not work, but it's the, it still becomes a memory. One of the things that I, um, two stories that came out of the class that were adorable, this one woman said that her husband's dream was to have her pubic area in the shape of a heart. She said, don't ask me why. It's always something he's always wanted to do. Well, she decided that they would wait until their 20th wedding anniversary before she presented this, his dream come true. And they went on a cruise. And she said, I didn't want to do it the first night because we were tired and exhausted. You know, we left the kids. And she said, so by the second day, I was feeling real nauseous. And I was getting seasick. And I got sicker and sicker and sicker to the point where I couldn't eat. And I mean, I was lying in that room. Well, she didn't know this, but her husband had called the ship's doctor. Okay. Now, don't ask me if someone can answer the question why. But she was in a semi-conscious state. And he said he introduced himself to the doctor. And he said, let me just feel, because you know, maybe it's your appendix. And of course, he pulls down her undies. And he went, because <gasps> he sees this heart. And the husband is standing there going, Oh my gosh, this is when you're presenting me it? And so he just walked away and she said she didn't go the rest of the whole time on the cruise. She wouldn't go into the dining room. She wouldn't go anywhere because she was mortified. Um, another, and again, it was a goof up, but now it's 20 years later. The other story is this woman, and I couldn't even complete the class, and there's no way I can tell it the way she told it, but she was married to a man. She was having um, 
Uh, he was a real macho kind of a guy, and she was having problems with him. She had written him notes all week long, and the last note was, come home, and I want you to, and it, there were candles leading all the way up the stairs, and then she had put candles all around the entire bed. And there was a note that said, I want you to shower, get undressed, lie down on your tummy, and she had a huge bucket of whipped cream and um, champagne right by the bed. So he proceeds to do that, and then she comes out in a beautiful teddy, and she proceeds to put the whipped cream all over his back. I mean, she just wanted to go to the restroom for just a second and wash the whipped cream off. And as she leaves, the door is, the door is ajar, and the Doberman Pinscher comes in. <laughs> it's a true story, and she said, she walks out, frozen, watching this scene as the dog is licking her husband. Now, he is ooing and eyeing. <laughs> moaning and groaning and saying, baby, you are the greatest. <laughs> and she says, turn around. And he looks and he says, if you ever tell this story to anybody, I will kill you. <laughs> Meanwhile, they're on my tapes and they've you know, gone around the entire nation. But the fact is that they are hysterical. Now, it was not funny at the time. You have to understand, she was mortified at the time that this happened. But later on, it was absolutely hysterical. So, you know, sometimes it doesn't work out, but it's still a memory. You know, I look at people, and I see so many of them like flatliners. You ever see a medical um, uh, story on television or a movie where the person has died and has mm, breakfast, lunch, and dinner work, breakfast, lunch, and dinner work? They're dead. And so when you think, I'm going to do something that is so, he's going to, he isn't going to believe that I did this. I'm going to put together a plan that is going to knock this out. You will be so nervous and scared. You, I mean, I don't know if any of you have ever done this, where you know you are planning something, and your heart is pounding all week long. And by the time you get there, you're the one that has had the beauty of being with this exciting thing for an entire week or two weeks, whatever it takes to plan. The other person only gets the enjoyment maybe for the evening. How many of you here have pet names for each other? That includes pet names for private parts. Oh, good, a couple of hands. I just don't want to be in a group where nobody, you know, I have had classes where nobody. Um, let me tell you some of the little pet names that I've collected, and this is tough. I want to tell you, this was the hardest thing. You can do surveys on a lot of things, but when you start asking men and women the pet names that they have for each other, they don't want to share this. This is so private, this makes you blush. But these are just some of the things, lover buns, pussy cats, snookums, lovey-dovey. You have a list of it. I included that in your, your list. <laughs> Pumpkin, sugar pot, baby duck, hun bun, poopsie, sweet cake, sweet peas, sweet cheeks, tiger lover, stud dumpling, love bucket, stud muffin. I love that one. Do you know I just told my oncologist that's why I love him so much because he really is a stud muffin. He's so strong and yet he's got that little boy quality. I mean, I just love that nickname. Sunshine, lammy pie, lover boy, pudding pie, hunky poo, bubba bear, big kahuna. Mm. <laughs> Honey, bu honey buns, apple dumpling, peaches, and teddy bear. You know, I was in a show, I was on a radio show in the Midwest, and I've got to tell you, this guy was about 6'4", big guy, and we were talking about the pet names and, and, and for private parts, and everything. he said, okay, okay, I'm going to let all my listeners, he was a very popular radio show host, he goes, I'm going to let everybody on the airwaves listen when I tell you now what my wife calls me. From the day we got married, she signs everything, every piece of stationery, she always says, hi, CB, and leaves everything CB. And you know what it stands for? Cannonballs. He was so proud of this. I mean, the poor people listening to the show. But anyway, <laughs> anybody want to share some other names that you have? <laughs> yes. Um, my husband um, just calls himself my little love play. Love play. Oh, I like that. That's cute. <laughs> you see, isn't this embarrassing? It just gets so red. But you know what? People don't share this. You know, when you see, again, somebody who's married for 30 years, 40 years, they won't tell you that's what they do. I'm sharing this with you. This is what happens behind closed doors when a relationship works. You do use these pet names. You know why? It's such a special way of relating. And I'm telling you, I've had, I had a woman in the class who actually got engaged to be married. And she said, you know why he finally asked her to be married? Because he looked at her and he said, you know what? You're the only woman who has a little girl that made my little boy come out and play. I had another story that was, um, um, we all had tears in our eyes. This woman said when her mother died, her father walked around the funeral parlor saying, who's Pookie Bear am I going to be now? Who's Pookie Bear? And everybody at the funeral parlor is saying, Pookie, what is, this, what is this guy talking about? And she said every day of his life, my mom would refer to him as Pookie Bear, and he'd say, Grace, will you please stop it for heaven's sake? But, you know, now she passed away, and all he could think of is, along with losing his wife, he was losing his pet name. This is such a special way, and it's many times when a woman says,
says to me, you know, I'm in, in and out of relationships. I can never keep a guy. You know, one of the things I always ask her is, do you talk baby talk? Do you know what the answer is? No, I never have. And I've actually had women say, can you make a tape of baby talk? And I say, you know, it's the way you would talk to a child or a puppy. You know, you raise your, the people. Again, if you didn't hear your mother talking to you in that way where, I love you so much. It's been two weeks. You know, I mean, if you didn't hear that, how would you know how to do this? It, again, it's something that we hear. And you know, I can walk down the street and the most vicious dog, if you talk baby talk to it, will just have the tail. I, you try this. Next time you see a barking dog, if you go over to that dog and go, I don't see that. I love it. All of a sudden, the little dog stops barking and the little tail starts to wag. And people are the same way. It's that little boy. It's that little girl. Now, some of you don't do baby talk. And I have men in my class that do the baby talk. They're great. At, my son does baby talk. He does. You know who I find can't baby talk? If you were the oldest child or an only child. If those two, usually those two are the type of women that come up and say, I can't do it because all your life you heard, be responsible, you know, uh, and you've got, um, you've got to act like an adult, grow up. And that little child, because any child can do it, they'll make Donald Duck sounds, they'll make all kinds of noises, they don't have any problems, but if they're punished and, they're, and someone says, you're an idiot, stop doing that, you know, or that, that's annoying me, then that little boy or that little girl is gone forever. So I wish you could bring it back. Um, I wish some of you could share some of your little pet stories. I tell you, women have gotten away with, we have been hysterical in my class. This one woman, her husband left that day and she recarpeted the entire house. And because this woman knows how to talk baby talk, she gets anything she wants. I mean, people will tell you that. You, if you have this gift, you know the power you have over a man. Because he left, he came back the entire house, thousands of dollars later, she calls him up and she says, I've been a bad, bad girl. <laughs> he can't do anything but laugh, you know? How bad were you? Oh, I was bad. I was really bad. I'm going to have to kiss you from the tippy of your head to the tippy of your toe to make up for how bad I was. Fine, carpet the house, do whatever you want to do, you know? So women that have this ability, they don't share it with any of it. You ever see a woman and she gets everything and you don't understand what in the world? It's baby talk. Trust me, it is a baby talk. Anybody have any little stories that they would be brave enough to share? Well, okay, let's talk about, on the baby talk, you don't have to, but I want some romantic stories or nobody's going to get these games. So give me some wonderful, like, oh, good, you've been thinking. Okay, let's go ahead. Well, it's not a real romantic story, but it's a spontaneity. My husband's real visual, so he's always saying, can't you surprise me? Can't you walk down without your clothes? You know, it's like, and I always said to him, Greg, if I can take off my why don't you give us his last name too? <laughs> but the problem with a lot of men is that, is that you, you come out in whatever it is they want you to wear and they immediately respond so quickly. Right. So there's this other thing in the room we have to deal with. Right. <laughs> and so I said, all right, I will do this spontaneous thing you want me to do, but you have to give me, like you said, the 30 minutes. Right. I want my time. Right. So he, his big thing is he knows I like the horseback ride. He's, and so I came out with just the cowboy hat and the jeans. And they were like, open. And <laughs> good, good. And I came out, and it was like, it was like a dream come true. And I found it, but then I said, remember, I do it. And That's that right. gave me that sexual part where I had 30 minutes of power. Absolutely. <laughs> there you go. I mean, there's, I wouldn't think there's any guy that would say no to that. I mean, you know, again, that's the most playful, wonderful way that you could present that. Now, and to add a little to that, the next time I put a cowboy hat on a seat in the car the night before with a note that says, you'll be back in the saddle tonight again, cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My husband's very shy, and actually I'm very shy, too, and I don't know what got into me. We'd only been married one year, and one Christmas morning, I got up early, took off all my clothes, and put a big bow around oh. my neck. And came walking in and said, Merry Christmas! That's, this is your present? Yeah, yeah that's great. I can't even imagine what I did that. But weren't you, yeah, listen, weren't you nervous when you did do that? Yeah. You know, I mean, your heart is pounding. You see, so many people, when they think about an affair, you know, they hear about a man or a woman, this is exactly what they're doing. You can create the affair with your mate. Don't you know that if you met somebody right now, that you were really attracted to, and you'd go away to this out of the way place, you'd be sneaky, you'd steal, you'd sneak behind people's back, your heart would be pounding, you'd be nervous, you'd be scared. You can create that same thing. The only thing I tell people is sneak behind your children's back instead of you know uh, somebody else's. Because really, the most exciting sexual experiences we had was sneaking behind our parents' back. That's what made sex so wonderful. So now sneak <laughs> behind your children's back, you know? And I, I tell couples, get up an hour early. If you've never had a candlelight breakfast, 
This is a wonderful way to start your day. Candlelight breakfast. Bacon and eggs can taste so wonderful in front of a candlelight. Do something different. Just change one little thing and watch the excitement. And it's the same thing that you would feel if you were having an affair. You were going to say something. Story has to do with dealing with kids and kind of sneaking behind them because it does make it more fun and exciting. Right, the threat of getting caught. Right. <laughs> well, one day I, I found a, a recipe in the newspaper for better than sex cake, and I thought, hmm, I'll try that. You've all seen that probably. So I cut it out and I made a card out of it, and I gave it to my husband in secret, and on the inside I put, You are invited to take a be a participant in a taste test or something like that. And then um, every Sunday night we have family night with our kids and so forth. And part of that is we sit around the table and always have dessert and share appreciations with each other. So I made this better than sex cake. I didn't tell the kids what the, <laughs> the title of the cake was. And we were sitting there eating it. My husband had gotten this card in secret before <coughs> with the recipe on it and this taste test to determine what is better, the cake or the sex. And um, we were sitting there, and, and I asked everybody, what do you think of this new recipe? And the kids are saying, it's great. And my husband says, we'll see. And he has <laughs> glimmer in his eyes, and my kids are going, what's going on? And it made it really fun, because we were basically doing foreplay in front of the kids. Right, exactly, <laughs> exactly. That's great. <laughs> yes. Um, I wanted to try to find kind of a romantic, playful way to tell my husband in December that I was pregnant. Mm -hmm. So he came home on a Friday night. And usually, you know, the baby's crying and it's, you know, I'm just wearing jeans. It's nothing that exciting. Friday night, he's tired. He walks in. I've got. I pulled out a black mini dress that I used to wear when we were dating. It's real short, and I put on black nylons and black sequiny shoes from Nordstrom. And I had makeup on and my hair done. He comes in and he says, well, what's for dinner? And I said, oh, we're going to have lobster. Well, you know, we never have lobster. He goes, really? And I said, yeah. And then I had set the table really pretty with flames on it to keep the butter going and all this stuff. And um, then just as we were coming out to sit down, I said, oh, by the way, we're having a guest. And he looked at me and he said, really? And I said, yeah, read the name tag. So it was my name tag, his name tag. And then I put the name of two of the baby's names that we would have liked to pick, maybe. Oh, that's baby. Mm -hmm. And then, and there was a big bear sitting in the chair, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, then he got it, you know. He looked at it, and, he, and it was just, it was just fun. It was just different. It didn't right. cost a lot of money, right. but, but it was something we both remember. That's right. And, it, and you took the time to do this for him. See, again, that's the message. The message is, you went to all this trouble for me to share this with me. That's what comes out, you know, that all this beautiful setting. You know, the other thing, too, that some of you could try, this is wonderful, and I, I really got this from um, a woman in my class. She said she invited, and this was friends, she invited her friends, and she wrote on the invitations, black tie, so they came all dressed up to the hilt, and what they did was she had this beautiful place setting in her best china and stemware. There was no silverware. There was just plastic gloves that were on the tables, and people thought they were going to have lobster. Well, she served meatballs and spaghetti that they had to eat with these gloves. And I heard about this dinner, and I thought, you know, I'm going to do this. Because I said to her, but you have to have people who have a really good sense of humor. She goes, oh, no, it's more fun if you invite people who have no sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> so I invited a couple of friends. I want to tell you, you have to have an extra pair of undies to see people dressed up, trying to be classy, and they're eating the meatballs and spaghetti. The only problem I'll ha I had, I went to my gynecologist at that time and got the gloves. I didn't realize, and they have powder in them. So my dinner was not as tasty as it could be. You've got to go, you have to go to a beauty supply place and just get the plastic gloves that you use for bleaching your hair. Um, but the reason that I'm, I'm telling you this is my friends to this day remember that dinner. And here, it's changing one little thing, just leaving off the silverware. Normally, you go to somebody's house for dinner, it's so boring. You know, you think, oh, how am I going to get through the night? And everybody was in stitches watching each other eat, you know, the spaghetti's hanging out. And even at the last minute, I was thinking, maybe I should just serve chicken. I said, no, it's the meatballs and spaghetti. That's the reason that it's funny, not, you know, chicken where you eat that with your hands. The dessert, the salad, everything. They had to eat everything with their hands. And if you do that with your husband, it is, you ha will have more fun. Do you know that almost every single person in their wedding picture has the picture of them seating each other and this beautiful smile on each other's faces? Now, I know that the, the vote today is to smush the cake in each other's faces. No wonder marriages don't last. But in my day, you would exchange and do lovingly, you know, feed each other the cake. It is the most fun you'll ever have to do an intimate evening 
and set up the meatballs and spaghetti or whatever it is, and you feed him the salad, everything he's got to feed you, and you'll just laugh. You'll have fun. See, I know that if I can get a couple who's laughing outside the bedroom, the bedroom's going to take care of itself. If you're relating and feeling close to somebody because you're having fun, you're enjoying yourself, you're not going to have any problem in the bedroom. But if you don't have, if you have a couple that doesn't communicate, they don't laugh anymore, they don't enjoy, you know, again, one of the questions I ask, when's the last time the two of you were absolutely hysterical laughing? If the answer is, I don't remember, you're in trouble. You really are. You haven't gone away and now you're not laughing. Those two things are really important for couples to stay together. One of the things I want to leave you with is, there's a thought, whatever you did to get me, you need to do three times as much to keep me. If you could just remember that, whatever you did to get me, you need to do three times as much to keep me. If that's a rule that both of you follow, let me tell you something, you won't have any problems in your relationship. And I want to um, end with reading you this poem. This is from uh, Nadine Stair. She's 85 years old from Louisville, Kentucky, called If I Had My Life to Live Over. If I had my life to live over, I would dare to make more mistakes next time. I would relax. I would limber up. I'd be sillier than I have been this trip. I would take fewer things seriously. I would take more chances. I would climb more mountains and I'd swim more rivers. I would eat more ice cream and less beans. I would perhaps have more actual troubles, but I'd have fewer imaginary ones. You see, I'm one of those people who live sensibly and sanely, hour after hour, day after day. Oh, I've had my moments, but if I had to do it again, I'd have more of them. In fact, I try to have nothing else, just moments, one after another, instead of living so many years ahead of each day. See, I've been one of those persons who never goes anywhere without a thermometer, a hot water bottle, a raincoat, and a parachute. And if I had to do it again, I would travel lighter than I have. If I had my life to live over, I would start barefoot earlier in the spring, and I'd stay that way later in the fall. I'd go to more dances, I'd ride more merry-go-rounds, and I would pick more daisies. Now, 85 years old from Louisville, Kentucky. Do we have to be 85 years old to realize that's all life is, moments. My wish for you is to just pack this life with as many memories and moments as you possibly can.